of all, Dean Nancy Gutierrez and uh, Dean Ann Cooper Moore uh, for their sponsorship of the event. This has really been a wonderful program, uh, continuing uh, now in its sixth year. I'd also like to thank uh, the indefatigable Susan Jaton, the senior event manager of uh, CLAS, uh, without whom this event is not possible. <laughs> and I'd like to, uh, of course, uh, thank uh, uh, Tanare Ojedi for his very kind introduction um, of my work. Um, also, a special thanks to the three student assistants, uh, Paddy de Arcia, Andrea Guzman, and Nora Perlman. Uh, so before, before I talk about the books, uh, I'd like to tell a little bit about the story of how this book came about. Um, what you see in this image is both the cover of the book and the cover of the book that inspired me, a photographic volume called The Wind That Swept Mexico that was published in the 1940s and that I found uh, on my relative's coffee table in the 1980s. But I'll get to that encounter in just a second. Um, a frequent question that uh, Professor O'J.D. answered for you in part is uh, why would a German come to the United States in order to study and teach Mexican history? Um, why wouldn't I be like my wife Annabelle, who does the sensible thing and study and, study and teach Germany in the United States? Um, <laughs> now, apart from the fact that my wife is m far more sensible than I am in many ways, uh, there is a little bit of a background story I think that you ought to know. Um, indeed, as uh, Professor O'Jady re refers, um, although my ancestry is primarily German, with some Dutch, French, Huguenot, Norwegian, and Polish elements thrown in, um, <laughs> My roots are very much in Mexico. Uh, both my grandparents were born there as the descendants of German entrepreneurs who have moved to Mexico in the last third of the 19th century. Uh, both of those families uh, that would eventually produce my father directly contributed to the foreign commercial and political penetration of Mexico uh, under the long-term dictator Porfirio Diaz that formed a necessary condition to, uh, to the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution in November 1910. Specifically, my grandfather's family, the Buchenaus, helped build uh, railroads connecting northwest, northeastern Mexico to Laredo, Texas. Uh, then, when that work was done, they provided technology to irrigate the desert in what became Mexico's largest cotton-growing area. And uh, if you study the Mexican Revolution in detail, which I won't bore you with tonight, then you will see that the original revolutionaries uh, came from that area. So my great-grandfather that basically made him rich and put him in a position to fight that fight. Um, now, my grandmother is another story. Um, that family founded a hardware store in 1865 uh, that is still in the family's hands and that um, celebrates its 150th birthday uh, th uh, today. And uh, it is in this uh, hardware store that I uh, did an internship after high school uh, because I was unfit, uh, declared unfit to join the German army uh, you probably know that there was a draft in Germany, and uh, my year, 1964, was so strong that they declared a third of our generation unfit, even though I subsequently ran seven marathons. So go figure. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, uh, my father told me that he wouldn't pay for college, and so I went to uh, work in this hardware uh, company to learn Spanish and to uh, get some practical experience. And uh, this uh, hardware store was very important because it imported cutlery uh, produced by, by the family firm near the uh, Rhinenburg district. Um, and if you see cutlery with a little tree on it, the tree brand cutlery, uh, then that is the one produced by my family. Now, usually these are very good knives and uh, razor blades. Uh, the sad thing is that ha half of all the Nazi daggers uh, pr uh, produced for the SS also had that tree brand on them and were uh, commissioned by my grandfather. Uh, the other uh, uh, claim to fame of this family is that they sold the ice pick that killed Leon Trotsky during his exile in Mexico <laughs> in 1940. Uh, so basically, um, I was going to be sunk no matter what. I couldn't study Soviet history or German history or American history. It was always going to be um, Mexican history. And within Mexican history, I think when um, I was 19 years old and I was in, uh, working in that hardware store thinking... Um, of becoming an investment banker, that had been my attention, um, I suddenly saw uh, myself in a country, found myself in a country where uh, for the, most of the 80 million people who then lived in Mexico, becoming an investment banker or even holding investment wasn't feasible. 
uh, I found a country that was uh, socially rigidly divided between the rich and poor, and where most of people just live from day to day. And uh, I asked myself why that was. Uh, basically, why, uh, uh, why are there poor countries and why are there rich countries, at least on the surface? Um, I, asked my, uh, I very soon lost interest in becoming an economist and uh, just making money. I, be, I became interested in um, studying uh, relationships of global inequality. And uh, my attention then focused on the Mexican Revolution, in part because of this book that you see here, uh, that my very right wing grandparents had on their coffee table, basically as a warning example of a time that was really bad in Mexico. But it, it attracted me because um, the first reaction that I had as a 19-year-old when I looked at the book these guys were really into it. I thought these people really believed in what they fought for. And so I became uh, very interested in the Mexican Revolution, so interested that I now believe, as uh, the political science chair Gregory Weeks knows, that I believe that the Mexican history uh, revolution is the pivotal moment of human history. And t tonight I will tell you why I think that that might be the case, or at the very least, I will try to rescue this, uh, this um, revolution from the oblivion where it's been placed primarily because of the concurrent um, event that uh, att attracted more attention. And those uh, concurrent events included World War I and uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a few photos that um, kind of uh, tell you how Mexican I am. On this photo, uh, you see um, my great-great-grandfather's family. In the center, uh, at the top, you see a blonde two-year-old girl, and that's my grandmother, uh, during a family reunion um, in Germany. And she was the one born in Mexico who came, who came uh, for the occasion. Um, here you see the company, uh, the family store, that um, basically was built uh, according to an American model in 1900 and where I spent my internship. And here you, found, you find their home in southern Mexico. Uh, so my uh, ancestors were not exactly the poor Mexicans. Um, they were uh, a group of a foreign uh, class that came to Mexico to make money to uh, sell hardware as it was. As some people say that they were exp imperialist exploiters. Other people say they helped Mexico grow economically. Um, uh, be that as it may, uh, their social distance to the Mexicans were con was considerable. Um, here you see one such moment in the early 1920s uh, where you see two of my uh, great uncles and uh, two gardeners that were among the staff of 11 that my great-grandmother kept in the house that you just saw. Uh, so this is uh, basically the wealth that I encountered when I visited my relatives in Mexico. And of course, that contrasted very greatly uh, with the everyday experience uh, of the Mexicans around me and the ones that I was working with in the hardware store. So if you want to make sense of the Mexican Revolution of 1910, I think I'll mention some general points at fir in first. First of all, this is the first revolution in the developing world in the 20th century. Um, so um, it may or may not be the most pivotal moment in human history, but it was first. It was the first major revolution of the 20th century. And it was primarily agrarian in nature. So unlike the American and French Revolution, it was uh, basically the, uh, the, the mass of the soldiers the mass of the people who fought were poor peasants because 70% of the Mexi uh, of Mexican population uh, was uh, poor uh, uh, landed uh, peasants and their families. Uh, then the second thing, uh, again, it was um, overlooked and downplayed in global history accounts. Um, even though um, all world history texts mention a little bit about the Mexican Revolution, it's not um, really uh, uh, part of the story and the only exception is my former student, Amy Strong, who's here tonight, uh, whose IB world history uh, class in, at uh, North Mech is the only uh, world history class that I know of that gives proper place to the Mexican Revolution. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, it has a revolution uh, that has profound influence on other revolutions, uh, Russia, China, Cuba. And like many revolutions, it had influence on places that didn't have a revolution. Uh, just like the Haitian Revolution, kept many Latin Americans in the early 19th century uh, tethered to the homeland and didn't um, lead to uh, wars of independence right away. So the Mexican Revolution profoundly influenced Argentina, Chile, and Mexico, the elites in those countries, in favor of maintaining the status quo uh, 
and against uh, seeking uh, social change. Uh, so, um, in my opinion, the Mexican Revolution happens at a pivotal moment, at a crisis of the imperialist world system during World War I, and has um, uh, really yet to be recognized um, in its importance. So, of course, when we talk about a revolution, uh, we first have to talk about what it is and why it happened. A uh, revolution comes from the concept of uh, planets turning around the sun to revolve around something. Uh, the notion is that revolutions profoundly change something um, uh, fairly suddenly and fairly violently and also fairly fundamentally. And so to do that, we have to uh, enter the world that my ancestors in uh, inhabited in the late 19th century, a world that privileged wealthy for uh, foreigners instead of uh, ordinary Mexicans. So the first um, element of the revolution was mass frustration with the modernizing dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, who, as you can see, uh, was a dictator uh, for 34 years. And um, uh, to put that in perspective, a lot of people didn't remember anything else. Um, uh, Mexico didn't really have social security until uh, in the 40s and 50s. So at one point, my grandmother asked her maid uh, to register her with social security how old she was, and the maid just shook her head and said, I don't know, but when Porfirio Diaz was dictator, I was 15 years old, uh, which in that case wasn't very helpful. But this, uh, uh, this guy was around for a total of 35 years, the last year, of course, embattled by a revolution. So that's kind of the political um, element. The social element is the alienation of campesino or peasant and indigenous village land by, uh, by large landowners. Uh, basically, traditionally in Mexico, large landowners had owned a fair amount of the land, uh, but until 1860, the Catholic Church and indigenous uh, communities owned about 60 to 70 percent of all the arable land in Mexico. Uh, that percentage in 1900 has, has shrunk to 15 percent. And so uh, landowners had alienated the land, uh, taken it away from either the church or indigenous um, families uh, in the last 20 years of the, of the, of the 19th century. And that's probably, of all the reasons, the biggest reason why the revolution happened, is that people lose their lands. A third, opposition to privileges of foreign uh, entrepreneurs. Just as the Indians lose land, so the foreign entrepreneurs uh, gain land. One particular study uh, estimates uh, that about a fourth of Mexico's net, uh, basically national worth or national wealth was owned by foreigners. I don't really believe that because that ba was based on North American claims after the revolution, uh, but that's still a fairly large amount for, uh, for the time. Um, so you have a lot of unifying uh, uh, motivations, economic, political, and social, yet you have at the same time strong regional differences. Uh, there's been the concept in Mexican studies of, man of many Mexicos. In other words, that Mexico, uh, because of its uh, strong um, geographical diversity with all the mountains and different region, regions, that you can't generalize about Mexico too much. And so, just like there was, uh, were many Mexicos, uh, there were strong regional differences in the reasons uh, why the revolution was fought and in the reasons why uh, people took up arms to fight against the regime. And I think that's really important, and it's also one of the reasons why this revolution is forgotten. In uh, the French Revolution, you have a National Assembly starting the fight. And yes, it was diverse after that, but the National Assembly throughout, I think, uh, took a certain leadership. In the American Revolution, we had um, certain um, elites from Massachusetts and Virginia that had unifying uh, characteristics. And in Russia and China, uh, we had small vanguards fighting the revolutions under set uh, ideological uh, prescriptions. Not so in Mexico. In Mexico's regionalism will make the business of explaining Mexican the, uh, the revolution more uh, difficult. So even as the old regime uh, disintegrated among a severe and ongoing political crisis, you already have the seeds of um, the uh, uh, revolution in different areas. The final element, which I think is very important for any revolution, is a permissive world context. The great powers at that time very much focused on other places, on Europe, um, Africa, and other places where imperial rivalry exists. And so Mexico, in a sense, gets overlooked by Britain, by the United States, by France and Germany until uh, the revolution has happened. Uh, to give you uh, another sense of the society that is dissolving, um, here you have a picture of uh, uh, afternoon beer. 
uh, by well-to-do foreign mer merchants and my grand uh, great grandfather the one in the way back um, uh, so he was living it up uh, obviously um, uh, had a great time uh, this is uh, basically a picture of the middle class uh, struggling to get an education the teacher is a future president of Mexico Plutarco Elias Calles and as you probably can probably guess I took this from one of my other books um, uh, but for the middle class education in a country that had 70 percent illiteracy was uh, the key to success and then here you have basically a woodcut that describes the struggles of the lower class um, the strikes that happened in central and northern Mexico in 1907 and 1908 under an anarchist banner uh, attempting to uh, improve working conditions so all of this is a sign of a society in great ferment and dissolution. Uh, which uh, I could now spend three and a half hours uh, going over the detailed uh, wars of the revolution. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to skip them. I'm gonna, just going to tell you that uh, they lasted five years uh, intensely and then continued off and on for another 14. And I'll tell you that about a million people lost their lives. But demographers talk about another million of prevented births basically births that did not happen uh, because uh, people were fighting. And so obviously uh, for a country of 16 million people, this is a fairly significant event. Um, more people were killed there as a percentage of the population than Germans in World War I, to give you one uh, possible way of looking at this. Um, but I think we can uh, talk about uh, an ideology, even if we're go going to forgo all these battles, I do want to give you some of the ideas that the revolutionaries had. And again, uh, these were ideas professed by different people. This was not a unified ideology, but one that involved different people. Uh, first and foremost, in my opinion, and that's really uh, where this book um, uh, highlights this point, is nationalism. Um, equal rights with foreign investors was one part. Is the, the, the Do not give uh, sell the farm to foreign investors. Uh, make them pay taxes and... Uh, uh, subject them to the same laws. Uh, B, teach Mexicans to be proud of their country. And C, assimilation of, but also pride in indigenous culture. So these were three elements of trying to make one Mexico out of the many Mexi uh, Mexicos. And as you can imagine, uh, this nationalism was primarily a middle and upper class project. Okay, this idea to make one out of what was a multitude, speaking 63 different languages and dialects, uh, the idea uh, was one that was not the idea of the campesinos who fought this revolution, but very much of the urban elites uh, who were on the bandwagon. The second one, uh, which was broadly shared across Mexico's lower classes, was land reform and more rights for workers. Land reform was a code word for returning to the indigenous communities and to poor peasants the land that had been illegally taken away by large landowners, whether American British or Mexican. Um, rights for workers simply corresponded to a worldwide movement uh, to let workers participate in the fruits of their labor. Recall that this is a time where in France and in Germany, uh, the workers already have social security legislation, have access to retirement benefits and health care uh, benefits. And so Mexicans, uh, Mexican workers very much want the same thing. The third was a st strict separation of church and state. This too was a middle class and upper class project, and interestingly, particularly a male project. Um, Anti-clericalism in Mexico is very much tied into a male revolutionary culture uh, that um, I'm discussing in another uh, work that I co-authored with uh, Gregory Kreider of Winthrop, who is also here tonight, and we just haven't gotten around to publishing it yet. And uh, limits on executive power. The fourth thing is Mexico, Mexicans are tired of 35-year presidents. Uh, so they set into motion a reform uh, that proclaims no re-elections are possible whatsoever. Uh, at first, president served a four-year term, then later a six-year term. But in Mexico, you can never get re-elected to a position that you once held, no matter whether it's mayor or city council person, senator or president. So this is an absolute principle. It only got violated once, and the person who violated it uh, paid for it with his life. He was assassinated uh, three months before taking office. So this is a very important, um, I think, source uh, in the ideology. And then finally, state-assisted modernization. 
Um, Mexicans do think that economic progress and technological progress is necessary. They still have a very poor road system, an underdeveloped railroad system, and they realize that uh, basically uh, the future depends on foreign investment, the future depends on um, modernization, uh, but they want to involve the Mexican state in this enterprise. Uh, they are not content with Wild West capitalism in which the companies alone dictate the rules uh, of engagement. Uh, they've seen too many ups and downs of the world economy to trust uh, the um, kind of the 18th century liberal notion of uh, the marketplace as, uh, setting these rules. Uh, so the following slides, I just show you a few of the participants. Here on the left, you have the revolutionary patriarch Francisco I. Madero, one of the white landowners from the north and a friend of my great-grandfather's. On the right, you have the famous Emiliano Zapata. Um, both lost their lives to assassination in the revolution. Only Zapata has restaurants named after him. <laughs> and uh, you probably wonder why Zapata has restaurants named after him and not Madero. Well, uh, first of all, Madero didn't really have any goals beyond the removal of the dictator that most people would agree with. Secondly, Zapata is the icon who fought for a land reform. And we still remember him as basically the revolution who most honestly represented this key idea of agrarian justice. Uh, then here we have a very interesting photo uh, because we have the two greatest generals of the Mexican Revolution, uh, Francisco Villa, another guy whom uh, uh, restaurants are named after, but not as many. The ratio is about four to one from Zapata to Villa. And then the other guy, Alvaro Obregón. Um, and there are no restaurants named after him because he was the guy who tried to get himself reelected. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the right are two very interesting figures, and that's General Pershing and General Patton. Uh, so General uh, Pershing and Patton, of course, are two of the most important U.S. military leaders in the two world wars that are about to happen. Uh, so I talk about the uh, uh, punitive expedition in Mexico during which American soldiers actually invaded Mexico in 1916-17 to chase Pancho Villa as the playground of the world wars. It was in that uh, desert state uh, that the American military got the practice they would uh, later use in both world wars. And this is yet another reason why the Mexican Revolution is the most pivotal event in world history. <laughs> it's because um, now you cannot understand the world wars without it, or at least US involvement. So the case is becoming bigger and bigger uh, with every photo. Um, and uh, I don't want to forget that this was also the first Latin American conflict with a significant involvement of women as fighters in the, uh, in the revolution. Now, these are pictures of the so-called soldaderas, or women soldiers, that were present in all factions, but particularly among the winning factions. And uh, even though these women uh, were not rewarded for their participation, uh, they did not get the vote uh, for president until 1953, which is actually one of the latest dates in Mexico, um, it is from this day forward that they play a more, more, uh, more and more assertive role in Mexican politics and a role that we have yet only begun to understand. Uh, it is really something that only in the last 20 years has become an important scholarship uh, area. And here finally we have uh, an agrarian community in the southeastern state of Yucatan uh, gathering together to deliberate their petition uh, to the government uh, for rest restoration of their, uh, their village land. And uh, so uh, very often uh, the agrarian experiments in Mexico, uh, as the land reform uh, got expressed, uh, was a piecemeal uh, work. It was something that happened in individual locations and it was granted by the governments, at least until the 1930s, only if uh, situations were particularly pressing. But it shows that the uh, Mexican Revolution uh, was really in many ways a bottom-up affair in which a reform was driven by local action and then uh, the central government's reaction uh, to such pressure. Um, so when the dust had settled, uh, here are the winners, um, Alvo Obregón and uh, Venustiano Carranza and their forces, uh, both uh, basically white uh, landowners from uh, the northern states uh, and uh, the head of the most modern army. And these are the losers, uh, two groups. On the one hand, uh, Mexican Catholics lose the fight. Um, 
the Catholics had, uh, had the misfortune of backing the Diaz regime, and then after that, the counter-revolution, and after 1915, they, they had to pay. And uh, so uh, Catholics are one uh, group that loses the revolution, and Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata and their peasants is the other group. So the, uh, the winning coalition that uh, basically assumes the reign of, uh, in Mexico is a group of northern uh, landowners, some small, some big, uh, that inherit uh, this ideological hodgepodge that I've laid out for you, that have to s somehow respond to all these demands, but who themselves don't really feel like they don't want, uh, they want to do very profound reform. And my current work actually deals with these guys and how they c came to terms with the pressures that they faced in the 15 years after the revolution between 1920 and 1935. Uh, th uh, uh, the book itself, and I should have probably said that first, um, is, is co-authored. The um, other author is my doctoral advisor uh, from Yale University. Um, he, of course, was my advisor, not at Yale, but at Chapel Hill. And if you're a stickler for a convention, you probably notice that his authorship comes first, even though his last name starts with a J and mine with a B. And that's not because he wrote the first half of the book, but because he's my advisor. Okay, you don't, uh, you don't cross your advisor. And so, so, so that's uh, basically the explanation of that. And I won't comment on exact, the exact percentage of the book that I wrote, but uh, we, we did do it together. Um, and so... Um, the outcome of the revolution is the Constitution of 1917. And I th really think that this is a kind of, if there's one thing that you take away uh, from this talk, I want you to know about this Constitution because it's really unique in many ways. It is the first Constitution um, of the world with social rights as opposed to political rights. So political rights are the ones that you find in the Virginia Bill of Rights or the US Constitution. Uh, political uh, uh, rights concern the right of the citizen uh, basically to be free from undue oppression um, or repression by the government. Uh, political rights concern a citizen's participation in politics, uh, the right to vote, and um, all the rights that are basically um, laid down in our Constitution. Political rights, uh, I think, insistently, uh, or people who maintain that political rights are sufficient, basically insistently maintain that if you pr pr provide a, a fair political game, if you provide everybody with a right to vote, and essential habeas corpus rights, uh, freedom from search and seizure and such things, and uh, freedom of the courts, um, uh, then essentially you will have a system in which um, the free play of forces will give everybody uh, an equal voice. So, so social rights is a new concept. Um, it comes from the 19th century when you have Karl Marx and the Paris Commune uh, basically lay out a different case for uh, a different set of freedoms um, or liberties. Freedom from poverty, uh, the right to have uh, a place to sleep, the right to health care, the right to education. All these rights that are not in the US Constitution, but that we do debate every day. We talk about, and whether we talk about Obamacare or whether we talk about the homeless, uh, we talk about, so we're talking about whether or not there's a right to, uh, of people to have these things. And um, even though the Europeans debated these rights and uh, English and French and German socialists all pressed for it, uh, the, these rights were not laid down in any constitution, in any basic political order, until they were laid down in the 1917 constitution. And so the uh, Mexican constitution, and this time I'm not kidding, the, the Mexican constitution is the father of the Soviet Constitution, not the other way around. Uh, the Mexican Constitution came first and uh, very affirmatively proclaimed that there are social rights. Uh, people don't just have political liberty, they also have a right to essential uh, uh, livelihood. Uh, guarantees for peasants and workers. Uh, a guarantee for peasants to have an acre of land, for workers the right to strike. Uh, the Constitution even lays down a six hour week and an eight-hour workday, I mean, uh, really detailed. Uh, and Mexico for the Mexicans. Let's not give all, uh, all of our country to foreign corporations. Um, of course, with that, they also have strict separation of church and state. I think uh, they still have a smattering of the old political rights in there. But most of these articles uh, that they have um, are really definitively social. Uh, Article 27 proclaims 
that all land and subsoil belongs to the nation. Uh, basically, uh, capitalists can only exploit it under a license by the state. Implicit in this Article 27 is the principle of eminent domain, uh, which for the first time will be written down in the 1919 Weimar Constitution in Germany. And so not only is the Mexican Constitution the father of the Soviet Constitution, but also the father of the first democratic German Constitution, uh, something that very few of my German friends know is that the Germans actually read the Mexican Constitution. And that is the topic not of my next book, but the book after that. Uh, since <laughs> since I, there are very few people who read German and Spanish, and so I have to take advantage of that. Uh, plus, it's going to lead to lovely trips to Berlin, and so I don't mind that. Um, so uh, I think it's fair to say that this Constitution will provide the model for other revolutions in the developing world later on. So what happened to this Constitution? Um, why is Mexico not today one big happy family in which everybody has a place to sleep and health care and, and education? Well, for one thing, it was implemented piecemeal by succeeding governments. Unlike the United States and other places, the constitutional order in Mexico by itself doesn't achieve legal change. It has to be implemented by a so-called ley reglamentaria or a regulatory law. And part of the reason why it was so ambitious and so idealistic was that the framers of the Constitution knew that they weren't responsible, they were off the hook for actually putting it into practice. And some of these articles weren't implemented until Lázaro Cárdenas' regime in the 1930s. Others were never implemented. Uh, so for, uh, for one thing, the uh, Constitution was theoretical rather than practical. Um, secondly, one of the unfortunate aspects of the Constitution is that it provided a blueprint for an authoritarian ruling party and it ruled the country in the name of the revolution from 1929 to 2000, they are again in the presidency today. So 71 years, the so-called and oxymoronic Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or Parti uh, Party of the Institutional Revolution. I mean, how a revolution can be institutional, I don't know. But um, uh, we're still wondering. Uh, in any case, this party is the second longest ruling party in the 20th century behind the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So another interesting parallel uh, to the big Soviet brother. And then finally, this constitution was eviscerated by neoliberal governments in the late 1900s. So if you go to Wikipedia tonight and you look this stuff up, you will find out I'm wrong. Because these articles are no longer there. Or they're there, uh, but the essential language has been stricken from them at a time when Mexico was deeply in debt in the 80s and 90s, and the International Monetary Fund and World Bank prescribed the deletion of these uh, uh, provisions as a condition to provide new loans and economic assistance to Mexico. But I won't even get started on neoliberalism tonight. Um, I'll just uh, say that, that I know that a lot of you are a very curious people and you want to know about the Constitution. So if you look it up, make sure you look at the original Constitution of 1917, not the 1991 uh, rebellion, uh, uh, revisions. Finally, and I'll close with this point, and I'm doing this in deference to my colleague, Mark Wilson, uh, who's here with his, his, uh, his writing seminar. Uh, there is a historiogra historiography of the Mexican Revolution. And this is the dreaded H word that sends many students in history uh, to engineering or business or many <laughs> other fields. So, so what is historiography? Um, put simply, it is um, how we do history or the history of history. How have historians explained the revolution in this case? And the reason why that's painful for students is that they have to deal with theory, and they have to deal with method, and they have to deal with historians rather than the actual events. We have a lot of people who just, they just tell us about the damn Civil War and about the Holocaust. We don't want to bother with the interpretation. But yet for, for historians, of course, this is what makes us most excited. Is when, um, and that's really hard for an 18-year-old to understand, that there's not one truth. Is that uh, history has the word story in it, and stories can be told in different ways, and, and it, it, it involves the discussion of opinion. So very quickly, um, how have historians explained the revolution, and how does this book fit into that? The first phase is a heroic phase, and it's defined by the book I showed at the outset of the lecture, uh, the, uh, uh, the big picture book of the happy revolutionaries who were totally into it. Uh, the revolution is heroic, and it's a great popular success. It's this great uh, example of people rising up, putting in place this really awesome constitution, and then fighting for a better Mexico. Uh, 
Um, the historians from this phase uh, pointed to the fact that by 1970, uh, so social justice uh, was far greater in Mexico than in 1910. That uh, you could take any measure of social justice, Gini coefficient or literacy rates, um, uh, also uh, mortality and all these uh, different indicators and Mexico was much better off uh, than 60 years ago. Uh, then there was a revisionist phase from 1970 to 1985. Uh, the revolution was betrayed as authoritarianism and underdevelopment remained. It's during these 15 years uh, that began actually in 1968 with the massacre of hundreds of students, pro protesters uh, at uh, Three Cultures Square in Mexico City. Um, that the uh, miracle in Mexico that uh, really showed its flip side. Between 1980 and 1985 alone, uh, Mexicans lost half of their purchasing power in, in real wages. Um, and that was in the great economic crisis of 1982. This was a, a case where the United States barely sneezed. But you probably remember Paul Volcker and 22% mortgages. But you don't remember losing half of your purchasing power. Mexicans remember that. And uh, so when that was set into motion, um, economic and social historians gave a different interpretation of the revolution and uh, basically looked at a revolution that had been betrayed and that had returned to Mexico many of the Porfirian dictatorial structures that they had supposedly fought. And then we have a regional turn uh, between uh, 1980 and uh, 2010. And I'm simplifying this a little bit because it was also suffused by a cultural turn. Uh, so at the same time that uh, historians become regional, they become cultural, they look at subaltern groups, uh, they start looking at gender and sexuality, they start looking at race and all kinds of other questions. Um, but to look at kind of the overall interpretations of the revolution, the consensus was that a book like the one uh, Dr. Joseph and I wrote was impossible uh, because the revolution had taken too many different turns at the regional level. And so for me, uh, since I was responsible, for the whole period after 1917, it presented the, um, uh, and uh, half of the book was uh, before 1917, uh, but it presented the unique challenge of making summary judgments about uh, periods in Mexican history while knowing full well that a regional or local analysis could disprove or contradict every one of my points. And that's why if you read the book, I ac actually do meander to various places of the Republic and to various different examples to show uh, basically the variability in the Mexican revolutionary model. And so this study of different regions and different affected constituencies, I think, convinced historians that a summary judgment wasn't possible. And that was why Professor Joseph, who is, of course, somewhat older than me, uh, began writing this book in 1985, uh, but didn't get anywhere until 2008 when I joined him on the author team and did the second half of the book, because he is a member of the third historiographical school. He tried to write this, this book, and he kept saying, I can't write it because I'm writing lies. I'm writing things that aren't true. Um, well, I come from a different historiographical moment again, and uh, finally said to him, let's look at a post-revisionist model. Uh, so let's look at the revolution and its symbols. Let's look at the revolution as an example that's important uh, for uh, both Mexico and the rest of the world. Sure, it has regional variants, uh, but it does have a national symbolic story um, that connects to regional stories uh, in different ways, uh, but that is worth telling. Uh, the revolution created expectations that the government never fulfilled, but that continue to live in the political imagination of the people. In other words, revolutions never, never die while the symbols are alive. While we have a Tea Party in the United States, the American Revolution isn't dead, or we wouldn't have a Tea Party, right? So uh, as long as ideas matter, the revolutions live in the images of the people, uh, for better or for worse. Um, a good example of this is uh, Diego Rivera's revolution, which is a mural in the National Palace of Mexico City, where he, in, on three walls, basically gives his version of the Mexican Revolution. And it's a Marxist one. Uh, but it's, in the end, it's a positive one. His message is uh, that Mexicans fought, Mexicans died, a million Mexicans died, but they died uh, for a better world, and uh, that example was important for other people. There's no doubt that, the, uh, le uh, that, the, uh, that this um, lesson from Mexico is still important today. On the left, we have a major demonstration in Mexico City um, 
from 2010, uh, fighting once again uh, for, politi for political rights and social justice. On the right, we have a town hall meeting of the Zapatista movement in Chiapas. The Zapatistas, of course, are named after Zapata, who's now been dead since 1919. He's no longer around to guide them, but his, his, uh, his example of land reform guides the Zapatistas even today for fighting against the neoliberal order. And this is an important example because um, I thought I would be done here, but I thought that I would show you this shirt which Professor John Cox loaned me tonight of the Zapatista rebel. Now, Professor Cox is a uh, professor of genocide and uh, Holocaust Germany, and the fact that he thinks this T-shirt is cool proves, once again, that the Mexican Revolution is the most pivotal <laughs> event in human history. Thank you.